good morning, Northridge, good morning. and welcome. I also want to welcome those that will be listening by way of the internet this morning. It is my privilege and honor to have this opportunity to share from God's Word with you this morning. Now, Pastor David has been leading us in a series on leadership over the last several weeks. And this morning, I'd like to just continue that a little bit longer. You may ask, why did he not do a good job? He did a great job. So you ask why? Well, because everything rises and falls on leadership. Our text, primary text this morning is found in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14, written by King Solomon, known for his wisdom. And here's what he says. For lack of guidance... A nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, you and I will never be all that God wants us to be if we don't learn the essentials of good leadership. And what better example for us to look at than the leadership of Jesus Christ and his ministry, amen? We need good leadership in our families. And we've just celebrated our moms a couple of weeks ago. And we're about to celebrate our fathers here in this coming week. And I just want to say that as parents, we have the opportunity to serve as the very best leaders ever. I am so excited about Vacation Bible School. I used to tease the folks at my church, what week are we having Vacation Bible School? Oh, that's the week I'm out of town. But I don't think I missed a single one. Jesus says, suffer the little ones to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. They have such simple faith. We need good leadership in our families. We need good leadership in our communities. We need wise leadership in our churches. And we need wise leadership in our country. I believe that we have three big leadership problems in our culture today. Number one, we've lost the understanding of the difference between a celebrity and a leader. See, celebrities are simply famous. Leaders get things done. And we have far too many celebrities in our country today and far too few leaders. Secondly, we have a huge shortage of godly leaders, not only in our country, but in the world. And third, we have the wrong kind of leaders in many positions, in sports, in government, in entertainment, in education, and in ministry. Now, you may be thinking, well, I don't think I need to pay that close attention to this. I may not even need to take notes because I'm not a leader. Well, I got news for you. If I could look each of you in the eyes, here's what I'd tell you. Yes, you are. You are a leader. Leadership described with one word is this, influence. And everyone in this room is an influencer of one kind or another, either for positivity or sometimes it could be negativity. Listen, if we don't allow God to show us who we are, we're going to fall and fail. So for the next few minutes, I want us to, to look and see how we can improve our leadership, our skills at home, with our friends, in our small groups, in our businesses, in school, and in this church. And I'm sure that you are aware of very large portion of the world is moving to our doorstep. Just leave here for two weeks and come back, and you'll see a few missing uh, orange orchards and houses popping up everywhere. It's unbelievable. And pray for some of us as we travel up and down 27 that we won't lose our salvation and we'll be a good witness. Amen? <laughs> I've sold my house in my mind I don't know how many times over the last couple of years, and it always seems to come to me on Highway 27. See, it's not whether you and I are going to be leaders, it's whether or not we're going to be good leaders or bad. I'm sure you're aware 
of the volume of people that are moving to right here in Polk County. This isn't the only county. This state is absolutely mushrooming. But right here in Polk County, this area has been the fastest growing area in our country for the last two years. God knew that when he bought this property and when he built this church. And you know what? It's going to take an army to reach the volume of people that are out there. There are some of us that have had the absolute joy of visiting every home in this neighborhood right over here. And there are many people in worship today that came because we went and welcomed them to the neighborhood. We've just started. And I hope that you would consider being part of that. Well, there's, there's really only one perfect leader, and his name was Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at seven principles of his leadership and the first one, if you're following along in your listeners' guide, is identification. The principle of identification. Know who I am. It's not whether or not you and I are going to be an influence, but we're going to, what, knowing who we are is going to affect our influence. For instance, the starting point of every leadership is I must know who I am. It is knowing your strengths and weaknesses. And your identity. Those are the three I think really help us to know who we are first. Our strength. Our strength comes from the Lord. King James. When you accept and I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, something miraculously happens. First of all, our sins are forgiven once and for all. They're forgotten. God puts them in the sea of his forgetfulness and he remembers no more. And he gives his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And some people say, well, you get all of them? Yeah. God's Spirit comes to dwell in his fullness within us. And so when, when I say that fullness, what are his, what is God's Spirit's capabilities? Endless. He's all powerful. He knows everything. And that, that power is in us. And if we will learn to tap into it, we can change our world. Let's talk about the strength. The strength is the spirit of God, but now let's quickly look at the weakness. What is our weakness? If you were to take a lucky guess, we'd say it's the, the flesh. It's the flesh. Paul the Apostle said it perfectly. He said, the things that I mean to do I don't. And the things that I don't mean to do, I keep doing. But it's not me. It's a sin that still dwells in my flesh. Third thing is our identity. Who are you? Who are we? Our identity is this. We are the children of the Most High God. Let that settle in for a minute. We are children of the Most High God. If he is for us, who can be against us? I might, get shout, I might shout earlier earlier later here. But it's just, it's, it's beyond my comprehension that Almighty God would choose to call me his son. And he cherishes the fact that I call him my father. So our identity is who we are. We're children of the Most High God. Jesus had no doubt about his identity. Here's what he said. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father. Let me run that again. No man comes to the Father except through him. He's the only way. You know, I will follow a leader who knows who he or she is and where he or she is going. I will follow them. In other words, Jesus was saying this, I am the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Listen, if we don't allow God to show us who we are, we will fall into one of three traps. Trap number one, if we don't know who we are, people will decide that for us. I think it's called popular viewpoint. Well, everybody's doing it. 
That doesn't make it right. Trap number two, if we don't know who we are, we will be making it up as we go. That's called shooting from the hip. It's called reacting instead of acting. And trap number three, if we don't know who we are, then chances are we will try and please as many people as possible. I want to share a couple of don'ts with you. Don't compare yourself to anyone other than Jesus. Don't compare yourself to anyone other than Jesus. So often we set the, the standard pretty low. We, we say, well, I'm not as bad as that person, or I'm not as bad as her, or that doesn't mean you're good. Let's set the benchmark a little higher. Let's compare ourselves to Jesus. How do we compare? And that's what this is about this morning. Second don't is don't copy anyone else's life except Jesus. You know, we have a lot of idols. We, we worship them. A lot of them are sports figures. Lately, it hadn't been too many politicians. Now, I'm not going to go any further into that, but <laughs> it'd be nice to have someone to look up to there. But listen, don't copy anyone else's life except Jesus. Ask God to show you your strengths and weaknesses and teach you how to use them both in his service and for his glory. It's good to know what our weaknesses are. So the first principle of good leadership is identification. The second principle of good leadership is clarification. Know what I want to accomplish or know what I'm called to accomplish. See, I must clarify what God has called me to do and the direction of my life. A good leader is, is not only does he know who he is, but he knows, where he knows where he's headed. You know, being busy is good at, if it serves a purpose. What turns activity into productivity is purpose. Let me say that again. What turns activity into productivity is purpose. Jesus said, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. He was very clear. So a good leader has a plan and a strategy. In the military, we give, we're given a mission. Whatever branch you're in or served in. And then it's left up to us to establish the strategy needed to accomplish the mission. Now, during my 20 years in the Coast Guard, we have several main missions that the Coast Guard does. We have the marine safety Watch for oil pollution and, and they inspect ships to make, their safe, make sure they're safe. Have search and rescue. Have law enforcement. And we have aids to navigation. That little lighthouse out in the foyer, that's an aid to navigation. What it does is the Coast Guard puts them out to help the Navy find their way home. Okay. Well, easy, easy. I got a Navy SEAL sitting up here. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> but, but a good leader not only has a plan, he has a strategy. So let me ask you this. As children of God, what is our mission? Well, our mission, should you choose to accept it, is to introduce people to Jesus and adopt them into God's family, teaching them to be more like Jesus and involve them in a personal ministry so that in all things, their lives may glorify God. Let me just shorten that into four words because sometimes our mission statements can be kind of long. Let me shorten that to four words, which are moving people toward Christ. You know, the first public statement or recorded that we know of, of Jesus was when he was 12 years old. He was talking to the religious leaders. And here's what he said. I have come to do the will of my father. And the very last recorded public statement was this. It is finished. Praise his holy name. 
Both statements were made by one who knew what he was called to accomplish. The third principle of good leadership is motivation. Know who I am trying to please. Now, you do realize that we can't please everybody. Anybody understand that? Yeah. Why is it that we try so hard to do something that even God can't do? You say, wait a minute, God can do anything. He can't seem to please everybody because he gave free will. I'll give you an example. On any given day, you may be praying for rain for your lawn and plants, and rightfully so. We need it. But meanwhile, I may be praying for sunshine so I can go fishing with David. See, leadership is not about pleasing everybody, but rather it's the art of managing some disappointments. Our choices are typically good, better, or best. So how did Jesus handle this? He said, to his, to, he said this to his father. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus' marching orders were very clear. It was the will of the father. And he focused on pleasing God, not on what others thought of him. A pastor was receiving a lot of criticism, and he asked Billy Graham this question. What do I do with all this criticism? Billy responded wisely, and he said this. If you wrestle with a pig, both of you are going to get muddy, but only one of you is going to like it. So if we're going to be good leaders, we won't listen to the critics or even listen to too many compliments because that's a trick of Satan too. Oh, ain't you fine and dandy. No, here's what we'll say. I know who I am and what God has called me to do and whom I am trying to please. It brings us to the fourth principle of good leadership. Collaboration. Need to work with a small group work with a small group. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Leadership is never accomplished by itself. Good leadership is always in the context of a team, a small community, a small group. To be a good leader, you have to build a team. All great leaders are great team builders. Just spent his entire ministry building a team. Some would say he won or he saved the world in a weekend but he spent three years developing, discipling, and mentoring his team who he sent out to preach the gospel to the whole world. Jesus picked his small group. Mark tells us about that in Mark 3, verses 14 and 15. He, Jesus, appointed them, 12 of them, and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. Why 12? Why not 50? Why not 100? Because Jesus knew the dynamics of a small group would include everyone much better. How many of you are part of a small group in this church? Raise your hand. Hold up high so I can see those aren't who aren't. Okay, hello. We've got room to grow. Small groups are powerful. We come in this large uh, church service and we worship together. But typically, if you have a question during a sermon or you have a comment or an insight, you don't go, hey, Pastor Dave, get, yeah, ooh, ooh, ooh. And most of the time, you're looking at the back of somebody else's head. So we worship together, but how much can we grow in here? How do you connect with other group, other people in here to get in a small group, to be part of a, a ministry? Jesus knew the dynamics of a small group. Not only do you and I need a small group, but we also need a thing called a battle buddy. <laughs> Someone strong enough to carry us off the field when we get hurt. To speak into us, to encourage us. And life is a battle and we're going to get hurt. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. Don't let that surprise you, but... I've overcome the world. That tells me I'm going to have trouble, but if I stick with him, he's going to get me through. Do you have somebody in your life who's strong enough spiritually 
to drag you off the field and nurse you back to health? I hope so. But better yet, and just as important, are you that kind of person to someone else? We're not meant to walk this path alone. We need spiritual and emotional friends. We need battle buddies. We need growth partners. Solomon, in his wisdom, wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12. Here's what he said. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better. For a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Collaboration. Number five, the fifth principle of good leadership is to focus on what's important. Now, if I was to ask any one of you individually what's important in your life, we would get a, a variation of answers. Oh, my children, my wife, my job. I would hope that one of those answers is serving my Lord. Focus on what's important. Life is full of distractions, cell phones, multimedia, computers, televisions, uh, possessions, and pursue them. And then occasionally we'll have that scroll. Yeah. We can get caught up trying to do so many things that we end up not doing any of them well. You ever felt like that? To get spread a little too thin? Here's what Paul, the apostle, who wrote most of the New Testament, Here's what he said. Here's the decision he came to in his life. It's recorded in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Here's what he said. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Those are the priorities. Those are what we need to concentrate on. Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. We must keep our eyes on Jesus. So what's important? Well, when we clarify our goal in life, we are then set free from the tyranny of urgency. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's a big difference between what's urgent and what's important. Now, it's all based on priority. What's urgent won't matter in a week from now, but what's important is going to matter forever. Having served as an ER nurse for almost 30 years, I can tell you priorities are set quickly and they're changed quickly in an emergency room. I've had people come in and they got a cut finger or whatever and they got bleeding and they got it all wrapped up and they go, come on, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. I go, I know. All bleeding eventually stops. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> but right now I'm dealing with a m massive car or cardiac event or maybe a, a, a stroke. Just put some pressure on it. We'll get to you. See, sometimes what we think is urgent is very transient. But what really matters is going to last forever. You know, have you ever wondered why Satan works so hard to distract us? It's to get us off focus. Anybody here ever have anything, other event pop up when it's time for your devotion? Yeah. Imagine that. It's almost every time, thank you. Satan doesn't quit easy. But if he can distract us, he'll take our focus off of what, needs to, what it needs to be on. He can't steal your salvation and mine. No. Because that's secure because of the cross of Jesus Christ and the sealing power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. By the way, we don't keep him, he keeps us. Amen? Thank him. Praise him. But if he can get you and me to off off of our focus, then our testimonies become ineffective or even worse, our testimony can become destructive. The Lord Jesus loved to hang out at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. They lived in Bethany and the scriptures tell us often that him and his disciples would come and stay there with him. He loved them very much. This particular story that I'm about to share with you, you've probably heard maybe. It's found in Luke chapter 10. 
And Jesus is there with his disciples. And Martha, bless your heart. I love Martha. She was in the kitchen cooking, fixing vittles. And I'll tell you what, it's good to have a good cook in the house. Amen? Well, there she is. She's preparing a meal for Jesus. And guess what? Meanwhile, her sister Mary is kneeling at the feet of Jesus. She's learning. She's being mentored. But one day Martha had had enough. Enough already. Jesus, I'm working and I'm serving in the kitchen and Mary's sitting here. Tell her to help me. I can understand her frustration. But listen to what Jesus told her. Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Good, better, best. There are many good things that we can be involved with, but what is best? Jesus wanted Martha to focus on him just like he wants you and I to focus on him. This brings up the story to me about Peter. I love Peter. I guess because I can identify with him. I can be outspoken at times and often before I think. And Peter was one of the only disciples that Jesus openly rebuked because he needed it. But Peter was also a man of faith. And the story that stands out to me was they had been serving the, the, the crowds and, and the multitudes and the night was on its way. So Jesus said, boys, I want you to get in the boat, go across the sea, and I'll meet you on the other side. And he went up into the mountain to pray. So they're on their way across the sea and the Sea of Galilee can blow up a storm in a hurry. And I don't know if any of you have been out in the ocean, but it's scary enough to be in rough seas during the day. But it's even more scary at night. And that's the situation we find our disciples in. They're in this sea, and they're fighting a sea in the wind, and lo and behold, here comes Jesus walking on the water. Is that his spirit? Is that really him? So Peter, being the spokesman, says, Jesus, if that's really you, call me so I can come on the water. Jesus said, come. And so here Peter jumps out of the boat. Now, mind you, Jesus hasn't calmed the sea yet. So he's out in the water. He's climbing these these swells and these waves, and he's, he's watching Jesus. And as he's watching Jesus, he's walking on the water. Then the scripture tells us that he began to look at the winds and the seas, and he began to sink. Why? And he called out to Jesus, And Jesus took him by the hand and raised him back up. They both got in the boat. Then he calmed the water, calmed the seas. Now, what is what is something we can glean from that? Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. No matter what your circumstances is, we've got to keep our eyes on the Lord. There's a sixth foundation for good leadership we see in Jesus' life. Meditation. In the first service, I said, you know, sometimes we, we jump to the conclusion when we hear the word meditation. I picture this little guy sitting on a log with his legs crossed, doing his own, maybe a hum, I don't know. And from what I understand about the kind of meditation, is the purpose of it is to empty our minds. Well, scripture tells us, or maybe it's not scripture, maybe it's just something that's quoted often that says, an idle mind is a death playground. That's not the type of meditation I'm talking about here. This meditation is listening to God continually. We are, we are to pray without ceasing. I put that the minute I get on 27 until I get off. Unless I'm going on I-4. And then I'll tell you to pray without ceasing. Listen to what Jesus did. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 records this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This is the Jesus who created everything that is. Nothing was not created that wasn't created by him. He started his busy day with a quiet time. A 
time of prayer with his father. So often we think of prayer as, as me talking to God and him listening. In fact, often we even reduce it to a wish list. Hey, God, I need, 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 need. I want, 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 want. Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. And you know what it begins with? Praise and adoration to the Father, not a needs list. But talking to God is only half right. Effective prayer is also us listening or meditating on what God is saying to us. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, often I've got on my knees, I've shared, thank you God for this, thank you for that, and we need this. And, and yes, we need to let our petitions be known. He said, you have not because you ask not. But it's a matter of priority here. And I've gotten up and never really praised him for who he is. And he said, if I don't praise him, guess what? The rocks and the trees will cry out. Somebody's going to praise him because he's worthy of our praise. Effective prayer is also us listening and meditating on what God is saying. Have you ever had a friend that's always talking and never listens to you? I used to. It just, doesn't, it just doesn't work very well. Prayer should be a dialogue, not a monologue. The psalmist wrote this, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know. We learn best by listening, not by talking. Think about it. Who has more important things to say? You are God. All righty then. Do you know what one of the greatest stressors in life is? And don't jump to the conclusion that I'm speaking about your wife or your husband or your kids or your job. No. I believe the greatest stressor in a human's life is this, to be disconnected from God. First, before we get saved... We're lost. We have no purpose. We're confused. We're angry. We're hurt. But even after we get saved, sometimes when we decide to climb back on the throne, push the Holy Spirit aside, and we become disconnected, we will find ourselves lacking joy, lacking direction, and maybe, because he loves us, correcting us. There's one more very important foundation for good leadership, and that is relaxation. Number seven, take time to retard. Why? Because good leadership is hard work, and it's draining. And we're going to do it right. It's going to be hard. Mark chapter 6, verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he, Jesus, said to them, the disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Rest and relaxation are never a waste of time. Amen? Jesus set the example for his disciples and us that we need a time of refreshing when we are in a leadership role. And all of us are in a leadership role at some time or another. God showed us how important resting is even when he rested on the seventh day. And I, I don't think for a minute that he did it because he was tired. He did it because he knew we would be tired and we would need restoration. And he set that example for us. Physical rest is as important to our spiritual walk as reading God's word and praying. Physical rest is just as important. Do you ever notice when maybe your spouse, and this may not happen to anybody in this room, but if you get a little tired, anybody get a little cranky? We can start seeing that at newborn babies. (laughs) They're either wet, hungry, or tired. 
And we get a little cranky. We need rest. We got statements in this country, burning a candle at both ends. That's not good. I've taken care of several people in the ER that have been busy doing that, and now they've lost their health. This doesn't sound very spiritual. It is. If we're going to take up our cross daily, we need to be rested. Now, we spent the last 30 or so minutes looking at several foundational things we need to do to be good leaders. And in closing, I want to, I want to share three secrets of lasting leaders. Secret number one, divert daily. Whoa, what does that mean? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what it is. And what I say here. Get a hobby. Paint. Sing. Shoot some hoop. Work in the yard. Wrestle with the kids. Wrestle with the wife. Whatever. Just divert your attention for a while each day. Put it down. Rest. My wife mentioned this to me several years ago. Paul, you need to get a hobby. I said, honey, while sitting in my recliner, I have a hobby. She said, that is not a hobby. <laughs> I said, I'm resting. She said, okay. Divert daily. Secondly, a second secret of lasting leaders is to withdraw weekly. Every week, you and I need to take a day off and rest and restore. So much. We're so busy. They said, all my dollar. And making sure our kids, everything we didn't have, and you know what they need most? You, me. So we, we just get accustomed to working six and seven days a week. And time flies by quickly. Time flies by real quickly. And you can't get it back. Every week, you and I need to take a day off and relax and restore. And the third secret of lasting leaders is abandon annually. Once a year, get away for that period and lay it all down. If you go on vacation and you leave your phone on, shame on you. Shame on you. I'm not taking calls. I'm resting. I need to be rejuvenated. I need to be able to hear God. I used to think my phone was so cool until I had it about two weeks. So in closing, I'm just going to ask you, you just bow your head and just, just listen to a couple of things I'm going to say. Close our eyes so we're not distracted. And as the praise team is coming up, there's some questions that I want to pose. Who's the leader of your life? Is it you or is it Jesus? Now that can change from day to day depending on who we're paying attention to and what we're investing in. You and I are leaders. We're influencers every day. Even when we think we're not influencing, we're influencers. Just listen to your children sometime. And they'll repeat what they've heard and they'll repeat what they've seen. So are we influencing for good or is it for bad? If you and I want to make a positive difference in our world, in our city here in Haines City, we're going to have to follow and apply these leadership examples that Christ has laid out for us. So I ask you in closing, are you ready? Are you ready to follow his example? Folks, the clock is ticking. Time is going by. Eternity is coming. And there are thousands of people right here in America, right here in Haines City, that don't know any Bible stories and they may never have heard of Jesus and what he's done for them. Would you determine that you would be part of moving our community toward Christ. Pray with me. Father, we, we bow before you humbly this morning. There are no words to thank you for all you've done for us. And yes, all you want to do 
in and through us. God, you've made your will so clear. You said the will, my will is that all men and women come to know me. And Father, I pray because you put us here for such a time as this that you would prepare our hearts and our minds and redirect our priorities in the days to come that it truly would be all about you. This we ask in Jesus' name.